Hi there, this is Reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, Chapter 24. So I had this idea I was going to decrease the amount of quotes I use and make this more dynamic with my own comments, I guess. But these chapters we're going through right now really set us up to understand the philosophy and how to use it. So I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to do that right now. I need the original words to really convey the message. The sun is up. For a while, I'm not sure where I am. We're on a road in a forest somewhere. Bad dream. That glass door again. The chrome of the cycle gleams beside me. And then I see the pines and then Idaho comes to mind. The door and the shadowy figure beside it were just imaginary. Okay, so that's interesting. So he's thinking about the dream that he just had. And he's, he's saying, oh, now I realize they're imaginary. So that's interesting um, thing for him to say. Let's just think about that. Why, why imaginary? And his attitude this morning is very positive after this terrible dream. He seems to be uplifted greatly by the realization, by this realization that it's just imaginary. And so he's happy to be back in Idaho, about to head down. We're on a logging road. That's, that's right. Bright day, sparkling air. Wow, it's beautiful. We're headed for the ocean. And look at this entry sign for Idaho. This is where... Uh, Pacific time begins. So what is this? Is this Pacific time? Let's think about this. Has this been determined with the analytical knife? Or is this something that has evolved? So that's interesting when you're thinking about some of these philosophical concepts that we're looking at. Which one is it? Or are they the same thing? So remember, when what the narrator says in chapter 22, he says, all traces of the East are gone now, at least in my imagination. All the rain here comes from Pacific winds and all the rivers and streams here return to the Pacific. So there's a felt sense, you know, there's an actual um, feeling of the environment that things have changed. I remember the dream again and the words, I'll see you at the bottom of the ocean and wonder about them. But the pines and sunlight are stronger than any dream and the wondering goes away. Good old reality, he says. So he starts jogging up the logging road to keep warm. And like a soldier, he chants. And what does he chant? He chants, good, 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 good. Everything he perceives in this lens that, uh, that, that emerged when the dream dispelled or when the dream was labeled as imaginary is good. Long Chautauqua today, one that I've been looking forward to during the whole trip and I've been looking forward to this too because he's really going to start giving us a peek now into how quality works in in day-to-day life and he's also going to give us one of the best metaphors for the whole process uh, which is the train metaphor which is coming up. I talked about caring the first day and then realized I couldn't say anything meaningful about caring until its inverse side quality is understood. I think it's important now to tie care to quality by pointing out that care and quality are internal and external aspects of the same thing. A person who sees quality and feels it as he works is a person who cares. A person who cares about what he sees and does is a person who's bound to have some characteristics of quality. So caring. It's a, it's a very big part of understanding what he's trying to tell us about how this whole thing works. And remember what I've been saying about um, that Piercing's philosophy could be really useful right now when the um, exponential advance of technology and let's just say the looming specter of autonomous AI need to be faced and dealt with so it benefits humanity because we could certainly imagine how it would do the opposite. So we're going to have to, you know, and I, people are doing this, but this needs to start being explored in a whole new philosophical system, I think is what we're looking at kind of needs to be embraced in order to look at this um, potential for technology in a way that is dynamic because it's going to have to it's going to have to manage a whole lot of things. 
And so is it even reasonable at this point to try to break down things into subjects and objects? And we've already seen with the frame problem that AI can't even do that, at least not at this point. And do we want it to do that or do we want it to be a dynamic system where things go in and that are processed in a beneficial way? So I know that sounds a little vague. I'm working it out myself. <laughs> The problem of technological hopelessness, says Piercig, is, is lack of care and um, the lack of being able to perceive quality in technology, being unaware that the Buddha is in the gears. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to say about we have to look at technology differently. Phaedrus's mad pursuit of the rational, analytic, and therefore technological meaning of the word quality was really a pursuit of the answer to the whole problem of technological hopelessness. So it seems to me anyway. So he's had to give us a lot of background to get us to this point. He's kind of had to talk us through, let's just say, uh, uh, the, the, uh, in a way through philosophical history, the history of philosophy. The... Um, and, and now we're getting to a point where, where quality actually applies. So the Chautauquas up to now have been getting us up to this point philosophically, going back to the classic romantic, technological, humanist um, split using John and Sylvia as opposed to someone who likes to maintain their motorcycle, the whole hip and square thing. And then back to the meaning of what is quality. And, and we figured this out with the classroom exercise, figuring it out that everyone could tell what it is. And back there to formal reason. Uh, to understand classic quality, and then back to the metaphysics of underlying formal reason, and then up to the mountain into the metaphysics that puts quality at the center of reality, and you remember those, those diagrams. And then down from that to Poincaré and science, you know, science performed with quality using value rather than uh, objectiveness to determine the best course of action. And now we're going down to technology. I do believe that at last we are where I wanted to be in the first place. But now we have with us some concepts that greatly alter the whole understanding of things. Quality is the Buddha. Quality is, is scientific reality. Quality is the goal of art. It remains to work these concepts into practical down-to-earth context. And for this, there is nothing more practical or down-to-earth than what I've been talking about all along, the repair of an old motorcycle. So we're starting to see that this whole motorcycle repair thing is going to show us how to implement quality in our own lives, which is a great thing. So um, so Lee gave me some more photos. You know, he did the whole route. So he took photos along the way um, from the year that he went, and uh, which was in the early 2000s. And um, right now we're on the Loxa River, which just entered uh, Idaho, as, as, as we know. The cycle hums through the cold air and the mountain pines, and we pass a small sign that says, a breakfast place is a mile ahead. Are you hungry, I shout? Yes, Chris shouts back. Soon a second sign saying cabins with an arrow under it points off to the left. We slow down and follow a dirt road until it reaches some varnished log cabins under some trees. So this is what he's talking about, thanks to Lee um, Glover. Uh, who, who informed me that this is the Loxa Lodge, and this is where they have that big hot cakes breakfast. So the Loxa Lodge burnt down in um, in 2003, and so this is a, a rebuild of it. So in the restaurant, Chris decides, decides he wants to write to his mother, and he can't think of what to say, so the narrator thinks to himself he should suggest that Chris write about one side of a coin for an hour. But Chris seriously wants help. This is really useful. Okay, I say. I tell him getting stuck is the commonest trouble of all. Usually I say your mind gets stuck when you're trying to do too many things at once, multitasking. What you have to do is try not to force words to come out. That just gets you more stuck. What you have to do now is separate out the things and do them one at a time. You're trying to think of what to say and what to say first at the same time, and that's too hard. Separate them out. Just make a list of all the things you want to say in any old order, and then later we'll figure out the right order. So this is interesting. This is, first of all, it's a great piece of advice for just about anything that you have to work out. Uh, certainly 
excellent advice for writing. And it's interesting because this is how Piersik himself wrote, and this will be expanded on a lot later in Lila, but he used four by six sheets of paper, note paper, and on each one he'd put a discrete idea or passage or quote of, you know, from his research. And so then the ideas could be shuffled around until they made sense, until they, you know, the order kind of emerged, like in Poincaré, what is the right order? You're looking for the right order, and it emerges from all these slips of paper. And as a writing method, it makes a lot of sense. It's dynamic, it works, and Chris ends up using his advice um, with tons of stuff to tell her. I'll never get all this in one letter, he says. He sees me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> he sees me laugh and frowns. I say, just pick out the best things. <laughs> Poncare. And then we head outside and onto the motorcycle again. And also pick out the best things, you know, let quality decide. So in the Chautauqua, the narrator segues from Chris being stuck about what to say to stuckness in general. And notice before we get into this that Chris started by being stuck, but ended with so much stuff that he was afraid it wouldn't fit into the letter. So we're going to start this off, uh, the Chautauqua off, by talking about rationality. And classic rationality was outlined into, uh, by showing us how to determine the chain of cause and effect with inductive and deductive reasoning, um, using the motorcycle, of course. And he outlined how classic rationality would break down the cycle into parts and into functions. And you remember those long lists um, in an earlier chapter. So... Uh, as we leave the high country and head for the ocean, we go into the practical applications of what a metaphysics that he sees as reality, that sees reality as quality rather than subjects and objects, plays out in everyday life. Stuckness, that's what I want to talk about today. Back on our trip out of Miles City, you remember I talked about how formal scientific method could be applied to the repair of a motorcycle through the study of chains of cause and effect and the application of experimental, uh, experimental method to determine these chains. Uh, the purpose was then to show what is meant by classic rationality. I now want to show that that classic pattern of rationality can be tremendously improved and expanded and made far more effective through the formal recognition of quality in its operation. Before doing this, however, I should go over some of the negative aspects of traditional maintenance to show just where the problems are. The first is stuckness, a mental stuckness that, accom that accompanies the physical stuckness of whatever you're working on. That's the same thing Chris was suffering from. So this kind of stuckness, this mental stuckness, he's going to illustrate with something that happens in motorcycle maintenance. And this is a screw that won't get loose, so you end up, you end up um, trying to follow the manual, and the manual says, um, remove side cover plate. But you don't really know what you're doing, you know, so you end up stripping the screw, you tearing the screw slots, it won't turn. Your mind was already thinking ahead to what you would do when the cover plate was off, so it takes a little time to realize that this irritating minor annoyance of a torn screw slot isn't just irritating and minor. You're stuck, stopped, terminated. It's absolutely stopped you from fixing the motorcycle because you can't get in there. And then comes something we've all experienced. It's normal at this point for the fear-anger syndrome to take over and make you want to hammer on that side plate with a chisel to pound it off with a sledge if necessary. So you need a hypothesis for how to get the screw out, and neither scientific method nor the manual is going to help you with that. This is sort of a, a thing in itself, you know, a thing that's just kind of arisen that there that is spontaneous and, and an accident, and um, neither of these have the capacity to tell you how to proceed with an anomaly, which is what this is. They just tell you stuff based on past experience um, or stuff based on... Um, the assembly and the disassembly of components being uh, without anomaly. The whole problem is we think we're supposed to be looking at problems like this objectively, and that's what formal reason tells us to do. We're stuck on that screw, and the only way it's going to get unstuck is by abandoning further examination of the screw according to traditional scientific method. That won't work. What we have to do is examine traditional scientific method in the light of that stuck screw. We have been looking at that screw objectively, according to the doctrine of objectivity, which is integral with traditional scientific method. 
When we stop and think about it disinterestedly in terms of this stuck screw, we begin to see that this whole idea of disinterested observation is silly. Where are those facts? What are we going to observe disinterestedly? The torn slot? The immovable side cover plate? The color of the paint job? The speedometer? The sissy bar? Okay, I included that partially because I, wanna, I wanted to include the term sissy bar. And I looked that up. A sissy bar is that small backrest on the back of a motorcycle that a real man would not need. So you can't look objectively at every possibility. That is combinatorially explosive. Poincaré said that. You have to look for facts that you need. But how do you know what facts you need? As Poincaré pointed out, there must be a subliminal choice of what facts we observe. The, different, the difference between a good mechanic and a bad one, like the difference between a good mathematician and a bad one, is precisely this ability to select the good facts from the bad ones on the basis of quality. He has to care. And I think that will be found, and I think it will be found that a formal acknowledgement of the role of quality in the scientific process doesn't destroy the empirical vision at all. It expands it, strengthens it, and brings it far closer to actual scientific practice. Uh, so actual scientific practice, meaning you trying to use uh, classical reason to actually improve things. So objectivity states that the mechanic and the motorcycle will always be separate. There will always be a subject and an object, and the involvement must be impartial. You can't care or get caught up in it. You have to repair this machine with pure logic, because that's the best way. Right. This eternally dualistic subject object way of approaching the motorcycle sounds right to us because we're used to it. It's a ghost. But it's not right. It's always been an artificial interpretation superimposed on reality. It's never been reality itself. When this duality is completely accepted, a certain non-divided relationship between the mechanic and the motorcycle, a craftsman-like feeling for the work is destroyed. So by turning, returning to caring, and, and looking and choosing what's best according to quality. That's the return of craftsmanship. That's actually definition of craftsmanship. And in a bit, we're going to go into that a little bit more, how that actually plays out. But now comes that analogy that I find so useful for understanding this, this, um, this philosophy, and that's the train analogy. In my mind now is an image of a huge, long railroad train, one of those 120 boxcar jobs that cross the prairies all the time with lumber and vegetables going east and with automobiles and other manufactured goods going west. I want to call this railroad train knowledge and subdivide it into two parts, classic knowledge and romantic knowledge. So classic knowledge is what you learn at school, what you learn in the Church of Reason, It's and that in, that comprises the engine and the boxcars, so, so you know, all that knowledge is in boxcars, and um, and the engine is the potential to you know is is leading all these boxcars. Obviously, the older you get, the more boxcars you're going to have, the more categories of knowledge. Let's just say, and you don't see romantic knowledge because how can you see it? It's it's not a uh, material thing. Um, you can see this train as static. You've got the engine box cars, and you can say this is, you know, we're going to analyze it, and here it is. Or you can see it as dynamic, that is, engine and box cars that actually move. And really, when you look at it, it is two different ways of looking at reality. Romantic quality, in terms of this analogy, isn't any part of the train. It's the leading edge of the engine, a two-dimensional, listen to that, two-dimensional surface of no real significance unless you understand that the train isn't a static entity at all. So in one, um, sorry, in one vision of the world, things like quality don't exist, and another one, they are existence itself. They aren't reality itself. This two-dimensional surface of no real significance, unless you understand that the train isn't a static entity at all. A train really isn't a train unless it, if it can't go anywhere. In the process of examining the train and subdividing it into parts, we've inadvertently stopped it. So it really isn't a train we're examining. That's why we get stuck. 
the train is always going somewhere and it's always going somewhere on a track and the track is called quality in, in Pearson's, um, in this analogy. And it's only romantic quality that keeps us on that track. So romantic reality is the cutting edge of experience. It's the leading edge of the train of knowledge that keeps the whole train on track. Traditional knowledge is only the collective memory of, of where that leading edge has been, like the manual. So I think one thing that's going to come up here is, is what are you talking about? Trains aren't always on the track of quality, are they? I mean, they get derailed. And this is... I'm going to say, as I as I discuss this chapter, I, I told you I'm not an expert on this, so this is a confusing point for me because saying the track is always on the track of quality, even if the quality isn't quality at all. You know, sometimes a train uh, isn't following the track of quality. Sometimes we we get misled, or or is this? Or is he talking about the ideal? Or is he talking about when the train is moving, that the train should be on the track of quality? He says that the train of quality, of quality only moves with quality. So I guess what he's saying is that if the train does not move, things don't transform. And maybe the train is not, you know, when the train is not moving, quality isn't involved. And it's only when the train is moving. So stuckness would not be moving. And... Um, he says, if you don't have quality, you just have confusion. So I guess stuckness and confusion are the two ways that keep the train from moving. But the train would move in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in confusion. In stuckness, it might pick something. In stuckness and confusion, it might pick a track that is off the track of quality just to get to where it wants to go, just because it wants, you know, this discomfort to be over with. Um, so I guess that anything that comes from trying to avoid or, or overcome stuckness and confusion by just, you know, getting, you know, by just barreling through it isn't quality. And I think both of these might happen if you use reason only because you think you're supposed to, because you've con been conditioned that the only way to solve this problem is with reason. And in fact, reason won't work in, in many situations. There are not and also another thing he says is there aren't subjects and objects at the leading edge. The only way to know where to go is to be attuned to quality, to, to be attuned to what's good. The cutting edge of this instant right here and now is always nothing less than the totality that, of everything there is. And I think that's very, very profound and important statement. Value, the leading edge of reality, is no longer an irrelevant offshoot of structure. Value is the predecessor of structure. It's the pre-intellectual awareness that gives rise to it. Our structured reality is pre-selected on the basis of value. And really to understand structured reality requires an understanding of the value source from which it's derived. So value is the leading edge of reality. And that valuing, that caring, if you like, that, that, that creates reality. It tells us how to proceed. Now, I love this paragraph because it's a great illustration of how, you know, attunement to quality in practice. One's rational understanding of a motorcycle is therefore modified from minute to minute as one works on it and sees that a new and different rational understanding has more quality. One doesn't cling to old sticky ideas because one has an immediate rational basis for rejecting them. Reality isn't static anymore. It's not a set of ideas you have to either fight or resign yourself to. It's made up in part of ideas that are expected to grow as you grow and as we all grow century after century with quality as a central undefined term. Reality is in its essential nature, not static, but dynamic. When you really understand dynamic reality, you never get stuck. It has forms but the forms are capable of change. So there you have one of the clearest statements of how this actually implements in life. It's a minute-to-minute -minute update, free from stuckness by preconceived notions. Imagine applying that to every aspect of your life. It sounds like the, it sounds like the goal of most spiritual practices. And now after he tells us, we all want it. What else do we all want? We want enlightenment. So is this, is this understanding of quality, is this nirvana, is this enlightenment, this ability attuned to quality? And I think that's a good question. And I think that deserves a little bit more thought in the future. So you, 
actually need your dualistic subject object church of reason and knowledge that you've been carrying around in your boxcars. You, ha you have to have it. But to work with it, to work on this motorcycle with that knowledge, you have to have you have to be able to sense the good, good, good as we jog along trying to do things. And he says you can develop this attunement. And I think this goes back to that beginner's mind and peace of mind that has been spoken of. You have to be willing to let it emerge while looking for it at the same time. It's a meditative state of mind. And, and in that state of mind, you're oriented towards quality, but you're also leaving it alone to show you. And according to this narrator, this is not just a, you know high Zen practice. It's all, also just good old-fashioned common sense. Like um, in, in government, for example, and this is why democracy is the best form of government, it is because it's dynamic. If we don't like what we've got, we can change it at the ballot box. You can get something that the majority of the population thinks is better. It all sounds far out and esoteric when put like that, and it comes a shock to discover that it is one of the most homespun, down-to-earth views of reality you can have. Harry Truman, of all people, comes to mind when he said, concerning his administration's programs, we'll just try them, and if they don't work, we'll just try something else. That may not be an exact quote, but it's close. And I know a lot of people, regardless of side, um, are thinking that what's going on is not good these days, that things are not getting better. And... Um, that what this dynamic system of democracy gave us is bad, and uh, Pierce has something to say about that too. The key word is better, quality. Some may argue that the underlying form of the American government is stuck, is incapable of change in response to quality. There's a definition of stuck, incapable of change in response to quality. But that argument is not to the point. The point is that the president and everyone else, from the wildest radical to the wildest reactionary, you certainly seen that these days, agree that the government should change in response to quality even if it doesn't. That's true. Both sides, even the radical sides, think that the government should change according to what they perceive to be quality. Phaedra's concept of change in quality as reality, a reality so omnipotent that whole governments must change to keep up with it, is something that, in a wordless way, we have always unanimously believed all along. So that must have be what um, he meant by having quality at the center of reality tames the system. I think, I can't remember what chapter that is. I think it's 21. So the system has to keep up with quality because quality is what's going forward on the track of progress and all the boxcars and everything have to keep up with it. And what Harry Truman's attitude is, is pragmatic. And there's a lot of overlap between pragmatism and Persick's philosophy. Um, Pragmatism is one, in fact, uh, uh, Henry, uh, Henry William James' pragmatism is one of Piercek's main influences. And then Lila, the character Phaedrus, is reading James's biog biography. So pragmatism is something we're hearing a lot about lately, you know, Jordan Peterson, uh, for one, because it is the reality, um, the truth, let's say, of the dynamic way we're going to have to start looking at things. You know, pragmatism, I think, is a good parallel for this, uh, or a good way, a, a good way of understanding what we're going to be terming as game B. But the point Piercing is making is that this way, this is the way we've always looked at things. It's more in keeping with our nature. And he's pointed out again and again, the scientific worldview, uh, because it's so powerful, ended up being pasted on. Let's consider reevaluation of the situation in which we assume the stuckness now occurring, the zero of consciousness, isn't the worst of all possible situations, but the best possible situation you can be in. After all, it's exactly the stuckness that the Zen Buddhists go to, so much trouble to induce through Kwan's deep breathing, sitting still and the like. Your mind is empty. You have a hollow, flexible attitude of beginner's mind. You're right at the front end of the train of knowledge, at the track of reality itself. Consider for a change that this is a moment not to be feared but cultivated. If your mind is truly profound and profoundly stuck, 
you may be much better off than when it was loaded with ideas. So that's a very interesting point. If you're talking about practices, say you embrace this philosophy as game B or what you want to do in life. So this is giving you an insight right into what you could do to cultivate this, this quality mindset. It's this, um, you know, it's practicing Zen meditation, that's what Beersik did, but some practice of that nature to get you in touch with that hollow, flexible attitude of beginner's mind. So he's saying stuckness is actually great. It doesn't seem that way, though. It just seems frustrating and dull, you know, that dull feeling. Um, think about that dullness when you're not motivated to do something. It's kind of this gray, depressive feeling. We like to be on on the tra on track all the time. We like to avoid stuckness, but we should embrace it. He says, eventually, the, in stuckness, quality will emerge. And if you push against stuckness, the thing you are, are liable to do is not have much quality. Like I was talking before about my confusion about being on the track. So, um, if you're pushing against stuckness, or or not, you, you what you're going to do, the decision you make to do is is going to be counter stuckness rather than going through stuckness and it's not going to have much quality it might be a suboptimal solution or a band-aid let's just say so you can't let and this is going to come up in chapter 26 but i just want to say you can't let your anxiety and frustration or as he said fear anger get the best of you stuckness shouldn't be avoided it's the psychic predecessor of all real understanding an egoless acceptance, egoless acceptance of stuckness is a key to an understanding of all quality in mechanical work as well as other endeavors. It is it's this understanding of quality is revealed by stuckness, which so often makes self-taught mechanics so superior to institute trained men who have learned how to handle everything except a new situation, a torn screw. And in this situation, um, a new situation, the novelty, the anomaly, your whole value system gets turned on its head. And the least valuable component of the motorcycle, which is the screw, suddenly holds the entire value of its motorcycle in that little piece of metal. So you need to be able to have a moment-to-moment flexible system of knowledge that allows you to take into account what is actually going on. With the expansion of the knowledge, I would guess, would come a reevaluation re of what the screw really is. If you concentrate on it, think about it, stay stuck on it for a long enough time, I would guess that in time you will come to see that the screw is less and less of an object typical of a class and more an object unique in itself. Your stuckness, important line, your stuckness is gradually eliminating patterns of traditional reason. So what he says is it doesn't matter what your solution is. So let's just say this torn screw situation, as long as it has quality. There are many ways to solve this problem. And there are usually many ways to solve a problem, just as there are many, many hypotheses. So you determine which ways to solve the problem have quality, and you act on those. Um, throwing the cycle off the cliff or giving up, these are low quality. And in fact, even taking the cycle to a mechanic to do the job would be a low quality solution if you're trying to learn. That would be just to avoid this whole thing. So your stuckness, um, so in your stuckness, quality hypotheses of solutions will eventually emerge. And in your stuckness, the problem isn't a matter of accessing past experiences in your boxcars as much as it's right out in front of you in the cutting edge. It's, it's romantic quality that will help you here. And then you can integrate you know, the knowledge you have. There's no predicting what's on the quality track. The solutions are all simple after you've arrived at them, but they're simple only when you know what they already are. That's good. So they, so now back to the, um, the journey. So they drive down Highway 13 beside the river, noting that the old technological buildings they drive by have more quality uh, than the new ones, and they have a quality from age. Neat squared upright lines acquire a random sag. The uniform masses of the unbroken color of fresh paint modified to a mottled weathered softness. Nature has a non-Euclidean geometry of her own that seems to soften the deliberate objectivity of these buildings. <laughs> this is so great. With a kind of random spontaneity that architects could do well to study. Well, some um, think of the Korean Wall. So there are two ways to look at this non-Euclidean geometry. Um, 
there's probably more, but I'm, I'm, what comes to mind for me, especially since we're looking at an integration of East and West in, in this book, is the Eastern way, there's, there's something called Li, and that is the natural gesture of nature. You'll see it in leaves, and you'll see it in branches, and you'll see it in, um, in the crackulor on the paint of buildings. And then in science, in, in a Western way, let's just say, um, this is kind of being sh demonstrated in, in non-dynamical systems theory, which is why I think, which is one of the many reasons I think that non-dynamical systems is a good, um, <laughs> is a good scientific theory for game B. And so here's a picture of, um, of bifurcation and look what it looks like. And it's also uh, fractal. So, so they leave the river and these old sleepy buildings and head into the Nays Pierce Reservation area. And then um, Grangeville, which I think is, it's either on the reservation or it's right outside, uh, probably right outside. And they stop at a restaurant. And thanks to Lee, we know this to be the Drifters restaurant. And here's some pictures of what it looks like now. At the top of the plateau at Grangeville, Idaho, we step from the blasting heat into an air-conditioned restaurant, deep cool inside. While we wait for chocolate maltits, I notice a high schooler sitting at the counter exchanging looks with the girl next to him. She's gorgeous, and I'm not the only one who notices it. The girl behind the counter waiting on them is also watching with anger. She thinks no one else sees. Some kind of triangle. We keep passing unseen through these little moments in other people's lives. Yes, that's the joy of road trips. You certainly do see into these little moments. And back then there were no cell phones to distract you from these, these little pleasurable peaks into other people's reality. And um, let's just kind of reflect on that because that's quality of the real thing versus these curated peaks that we see on social media. What a big difference. So apparently... Um, there's a canyon road between Grangeville and their next stop in Whitebird, which uh, I'm not quite sure what state that is, but we'll find out. Sorry, I should be more prepared. We'll find out in the next next chapter. Um, so, so this is this is 95, and it's full of twists and turns going down the canyon. And here's a picture. By the time our cycle has reached the bottom of wherever it is we are, we have dropped thousands of feet. I look back over my shoulder and see ant-like cars way back at the top. Now we must head forward across this baking desert to wherever the road leads. So I hope that made sense, and I will see you next week, next Sunday, for Chapter 25.